Welcome to Straight Talk with me, Peter Martin. I'm delighted to say this week's guest is a comedian, an actress, a writer. Karen Dunbar is with me. I'm absolutely delighted. I've waited quite a while to get you, but finally, hey. after 35 years, we're Aye. back together. I, I know. Because I can't believe you and I actually worked together. Worked together in bonkers show bar, <laughs> Peter, in air. No, even the Glasgow one. The air one. Uh, the great thing about uh, you know watching your career and how it's blossomed is the fact that you've got to start somewhere and cut your teeth. Mm. And I'm glad that your career, you know, whether it was Bonkers or you maybe been CC Blooms or all these places, mm. you actually know how it is to handle people, the good bits, the bad bits, mm. the heckles, all of that. You cut your teeth almost like the great people of the past who hit vaudeville and knew how to do it mm. when they went on to a greater level. Well, I'll take that. Aye, it was when I started off, I was hosting a karaoke in Bonkers in Air. I had no patter, no nothing, no confidence. I could sing a bit and that was all. But when folk are sort of flinging pints of 70 shilling at you, you kind of, you, you, you toughen up quite quickly. Did you sense it? I, I noticed that even from a from a, a very young age, there might have been two or three things that affected you growing up that may well have toughened you up and and basically made you who the person you are today. I mean, for example, you growing up, I, I read somewhere that you were adopted, mm. um, and <clears throat> and of course you you long to be liked by people. Was that something? Aye, was that that was some eh, aye. So I was adopted. I was adopted by my granny and grandpa. Right. So it's that kind of. Do you know I've heard a phrase a month ago that I'd never heard, and I was like, oh my god, because it was me. It's kinship care. Yeah. So brought up in kinship care. So with my granny and grandpa, um, and that that need to be liked, which I think is a big part. That's a human instinct. Yeah. Right. Because if you don't stick with the herd, then you're outside the herd and you get picked off. Right. So you need to be liked, but the level it was actually be dramatic. Let's start. I start with the drama. You know, it was crippling on me. Yeah. Yeah, because I used humour to avoid getting bullied. Right. That helped me when I was younger. Um, and, uh, you know, not so much a longing to be part of the end crew, but even if I wasn't, if I thought I was going to be cornered, I used humour to get out of it. Is that the way Aye, you started? It's exactly the same. And it, oh, there was also there was like a sense of control in it that if I was laughing at myself and I was making people laugh at me, then I would take away their ability to do it. You know, I could I could make a fool of myself better than they could. Yeah. Uh, um, did, you, did that, from an early age form a thought process in your mind where you thought I want to be this or that or did you just fall <clears> into it? That's a great question because I don't know if you know when my birthday I don't know if you Wikipedia'd my birthday I didn't right so it's <laughs> April Fool's Day right it's my birthday and I remember thinking long ago like did I play the fool because I was told I was the fool do you know ah yeah we fool you know, April Fool's Day we fool and, and so did I play to that or was it chicken and egg anyway Page and Dr. Freud, we'll never know. Yeah. Um, so I, I definitely, I knew I, I, I did things and people laughed and that gave me a buzz. Or I would know, I would know, knew it was dopamine, <laughs> right? That's where my dopamine is coming from. But it's, you know, if I'm, a, I'm, if I'm an addict to anything, it's dopamine. Yeah. I'll just get it in different ways. <laughs> um, and um, and so there was some in that. But I remember being pff, five, six year old and folks saying, and what are you wanting to do when you grow up, Pen? And I was, I, my answer was, I'm going to be on the telly. Right. It wasn't it. And I, I don't even think there was arrogance in that. It was mere, oh no, that's what's going to happen. It wasn't even like that's what I'm going to do. It was like that's what's going to happen. It was a weird thing. I mean, I'm not going to get all like psychic and hear voices in because I'm no in that. I'm no in that uh, energy. Yeah. But it was definitely a um, no. That's what I'll do. Yeah. And I had no idea how. How? But yeah. Because as far as I was concerned, folk that were on telly were rich, <laughs> smart, <laughs> and posh. Right. Okay. Uh, I yeah. might have had a bit of smarts about me, but certainly the rich and posh was not in my life. Well, if you made people laugh, who made you laugh? There has to be an inspiration. Mm. The but the one that every well the majority of people have to say at, at that time in the mid 1970s was Billy Connolly, and I remember my sister buying me the Billy Connolly Billy Connolly album. I think it was Cop Your Whack. Yeah. 
the yellow one, I think, and inside it, he's got a mitre on and everything, and he's, anyway, um, and like, vestments or something, so whatever that album was, so she bought me that for my birthday, I was five or something, I had no idea what it was, all. and then a bit of, I think she bought it for herself, but I remember that being played, and everybody laughing at it. Yeah. Everybody knew who's laughing. Did you feel as if that opened the door? Because you mentioned there, oh, you know, it's great. It makes you, you know, you rich people, posh people. You don't fit that stereotype. So in a way, hearing Conley, hear somebody who's related to right. your area and can laugh at the things that you laugh at. It's all right hearing, you know, a great English comic, an American comic. But if you hear somebody that's one of your own, mm. is that, did that Absolutely. fill you full of confidence? Well... It's, I wouldn't have been conscious of it filling me with confidence, but what I was aware of is, you know, there's that phrase, if you can't see it, you can't be it. Yeah. So that a working class famous person existed, that was, uh, that was uh, right, if that, could, that can happen, therefore... I can do that. Yeah. Uh, and another notch of this was Billy Connolly, but the, a stronger one than that was Elaine C. Smith because she was a woman. Well, I was going to say to you because uh, you're, you're obviously saying, I want to be on the telly. I don't know what I want to do. I've heard Billy Connolly. That's great. He makes people laugh as well. But from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s, and I do not want to go down a road of women can't achieve anything or they weren't allowed to achieve it. I'd rather say to you, mm. did you view it as this is going to be doubly difficult because I'm a woman? No, I wouldn't have been aware of that, really. No. Um, I, on a subconscious level, obviously, what I would have known was that there was a lack of women doing stuff like that. So people like Elaine, which I remember seeing her on uh, uh, Naked Video, and going, oh my God, that's a woman, a Scottish woman doing it. I'd already seen like people like French and Saunders, uh, Victoria Wood. Um, oh, there was another one, I can never remember her full name, but her first name was Karen. She had a show... She used to do impersonations of Priscilla Black and everything. I remember seeing her on the Des O'Connor show. So was that um, Josie Lawrence? Do you remember Josie Lawrence? No, where was she it? was on Whose Line Is It Anyway? All oh, right, I was about right. sixteen by that point. And short story, I uh, was on at the Edinburgh Festival. I was on in the big room in the Gilded Balloon, the main spot. And I come down the stair, and uh, well, the woman that ran it was she was standing at the front door, and she went, "Is that you, Abby?" And I says, "Arms." She went, "I'll just introduce you. This is Josie Lawrence." And I <laughs> made a total <laughs> tube of myself. I went, oh, my God, I love you. <laughs> Straight out. And she went, oh, thank you. And I went, no, I really, oh, my God, I love you. <laughs> and then I went, because I watched you. I said, I watched you and I wanted to do what you do. And now I'm doing it anyway. Thank you. I need to go. And then I was touched. I no touched on a problem. I was like, oh, oh. And then I ended up working with her, but that is the that is the most I've crumbled when I've met, and I've met quite a few famous folk, and that was, I met Billy Connolly, and I was the same as I was with Josie Lawrence, <laughs> then I knew I was going, I knew I was meeting him, I didn't, so it was a surprise, so anyway, seeing women doing that, uh, but Billy was the start, Kenny Everett was a big, big party as well, because I was just a kid, and he was so kind of zany, and there's a word, and I felt like I could be like him, so I knew I was going to do it, I was 10 year old, and I wrote in my diary, I can Deborah and Bar, middle <laughs> name, full name, dead serious, swear one day to be on television. Yeah. Look out, world, here I come. Yeah, absolutely. And signed it. Another thing I was going to say to you, though, is, you know, you mentioned Kenny Everett there. Even from the days of standing up and be able to handle hecklers and, and be the, the host, um, you know, from bonkers to CC Blooms to a, any of those type of gigs, you do have to dress up, you do have to camp it up, you do have mm. to, you know, in, in essence, I think that was a great grounding for you for what you would eventually go on to, because it's just, it's sketch after sketch, isn't it? Aye. The, the characters... I mean, somebody said recently, how do you write the character? How do you come up with the characters? And I'm like, oh, I don't really have a set way to do it. Usually a voice comes out that is subconscious and then it builds for there. But their voices were being honed accidentally. I mean, when I was working in, a, you know, I moved on to hosted karaoke in Bonkers and then I started my own business because I was getting £2.10 an hour in Bonkers. <laughs> Before, before tax and after a year I was like ah, I, think, I think I can maybe make more money out of this um, and so I just I did it for myself went into places like CC's Delmonica's yeah. um, Will you write your own stuff? Well hi, but I've seen writing that sounds like you've got a pen and a bit of right sorry <laughs> 
make sure that I'm uh, aligned with the web. Um, the, uh, so I'm, it sounds like, like a pen and a bit of paper and writing things down, and I know that's not what you mean, but yeah. so was I creating my own stuff? Yeah. 100%. Right. But I wasn't consciously saying, right, this is what I'm going to do next week. This is, it was just coming out. I would be like, oh, do you know what? I'm going to tell them the story. Or if something would happen to me through the week, and I would be, but I wouldn't craft that. Yeah. I wouldn't look at how to tell it like as a narrative arc. Oh, I see all the stuff I know. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, a beginning, middle, and an end, and <laughs> You're stuff. Just like. verging on posh there, you know. Aye, that, don't you? <laughs> I have learned a lot. Well, that, that's all Google knowledge I've got. So, where's the sliding doors moment when suddenly somebody says to you, Aye, "You're so good, this is happening. Go and audition for it." I'm sure there's a few mini ones like getting the job in Bonkers because that was the start of me working in some kind of entertainment. Um, but I walked into a pub that I was working in called Sadie Frost. It was underneath Queen Street Station. Yeah. Um, and it was a Tuesday in December. I was drap math costume. I drew a panto for the pub, right? For the bar staff and meet put on at Christmas, right? And I had got went to the uh, party shop and got costumes and I was dumping them in the back room and then going on, put some in Tuesday afternoon. And a voice says, Karen, and I looked around and I was like, I couldn't even see MD. It was a basement pub. And I went to walk out, Karen, and I looked around and it was a guy that I'd been at school with, Vance. And he says, uh, I can't believe I saw you today. He lived in Stirling. He says, I'm in here for a pint before I get the train. He says, I was doing with my pal who was at the open auditions at the comedy unit. And I kept thinking Candy Bar should go to them. And I says, Vance, I don't even know what it is. I says, what's the comedy unit? He says, the folk that make Rabs in Esbitt. And I went, I don't even know what to do. I've never been to an audition in my life because I don't know if you would believe this or days, but I'm not trained. Right. Um, and he says, well, I'm just telling you it's on. Anyway. The short version of that is I phoned 192 and got the number <laughs> for the comedy unit and they had one uh, audition left on the Thursday, two days later. Wow. And I, and, and I wrote with a pen and a bit of paper. I thought, what will I do? Because I didn't know what to do. So I just wrote out stuff about myself, but I made it funny. And I thought, I'm not going to go in as myself. I'll dress up as an old woman. I mean, that's acting and script writing. Yeah. I wouldn't have called it that at the time. In a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, nervous. That was it. Meeting Vance, who, funny, I'll be on the phone to Vance tomorrow night. Yeah. Pals. Nervous. So, uh, apoplectic. Yeah. To the point that I, to the point that I thought, I can't do this. Now, I'd been working for seven years, and although in some ways that's, that feels like a short time, I was out five nights a week, five hours, or, so there's 25 hours a week for seven years. Yeah. Say that roughly. With a mic my own or it's DJing. A graft. Aye. Um and and so there was a lot of things that I didn't have nerves with, but I was really nervous about this. And I remember looking in the mirror, but like doing the stairs in the place where the audition was, and I was dressed up as an old woman with a bobble hat on and a penny. <laughs> um and I, I was twenty seven at the time. No, twenty six. Right. Nineteen ninety seven. End of ninety seven. I remember looking in the mirror and I'm like, like that. They can sh they're not gonna shoot you and you'll not get arrested. So on you go, come yeah. on. Give it your best shot. I was apoplectic with nerves. But see, once I get in the room, they go, you'll know it yourself. Once you go through the curtain, yeah. something changes. And with that, you join a group of people who, they're embarking on something that, that you know, at times I, I think, certainly in Scottish television, you know, once in a generation, something special happens. Mm. Mm. I mean, that's what happened to you guys. It was unbelievable. Yeah. Aye, it is. It's... How did you feel when you met all your, your fellow cast members? This is you embarking on something which is right outside your comfort zone. Aye, aye because I had never never done anything like that. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't even done any. I'd, I'd, when I say I'd done radio, I'd been interviewed because I did a thing at the Edinburgh Festival, so hardly any of that. And tune of fact, it was on the radio to start with. Yeah. It was on Radio Scotland for two series. Uh the comedy unit, what they did was they, they, they phoned me back the next day and they says, come in and see us. And it was just coming up to Christmas, December, which will be when Christmas is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it was Easter. Anyway, um, so they says, come in and see us. Went in and they says, well, let's put a show on for you and we'll get an idea of what it is you can do. Uh, and that, so that was in the March. And I was to write the show, pen and bit of paper. In between which that was, that I was just stressed because I'd never done that. Yeah. This stress. Anyway, uh, and they brought Ford and Greg, so I had never met, I hadn't met Ford and Greg at all. They brought Ford and Greg to that. 
Um, and after that, I remember meeting them at the bar, and, the, and they were just, they were dead cool, but yeah. they were dead nice, so well done. I mean, I, I was singing and everything on it, so it wasn't, I did comedy, I did stand-up, I did sketches, but I sung the last song I sung, and I was a belter, a yeah, singer at the time, my voice isn't that great now. Uh, I sung, and I am telling you, I'm not going. Bloody hell, man. Finish that's it. Not, and to finish. That's not a finish, that's actually, a grandstand. I remember Ford saying at the end, he says, see when you start at that song, I thought, Oh, this will be interesting. He says, but you did it. He says, and the bit at the end, you know, she goes, let yeah. me, yeah. He says, and you see, we did that. He's like, ah, that's it. That's it. So I got on great for the for the get go with him. And and from there, <coughs> was there a discussion then? Because I I look at the characters that were in that show. I mean, there are iconic moments that I think you should feel, or do you feel tremendously proud of them? I swear to God. <laughs> That's scary, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Um, I pride's a funny word, and I, I don't know where I, mean, I was interested in my own psyche, right? Yeah. So let me know good in the Freudian route, but I feel, I don't know, the, the word that's come at me is chuffed, right? I yeah. can get that connection. No, I couldn't then. Uh, all I could do at the time was, nah, I shouldn't have done it like that. I should have, nah, see, that's too long. That pause, nah. That was relentless, man. And I don't know what that is. Well, that's, again, Paige and Dr. Freud, whatever goes on in that. But, I mean, I don't feel that new. I mean, I'm addicted to TikTok like most, most people on the yeah. planet. And when I'm scrolling through things occasionally, like a tune of fat, the Camden Basho will come up. And yeah. it's stuff that I haven't seen for years. And I'm like, oh. So I have a warmth towards it. I have a... Um, it's like seeing photos of somebody that, like, uh, a party in the 1970s, like, oh, she was great. Yeah. It's like that. Oh, that was great. That night was great. Yeah, because you it's... don't want to look back too much because you've always wanted to look ahead. Surely. But I think when I look back at it, I mean, I'm, I, 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 I'd written down, <coughs> excuse me, a whole wad of, you know, characters. Some people are lucky and they get one with a catchphrase. Mm. But I look at, you know, Ford and Kiernan, um, Paul Riley, the whole cast, they all have their wee bits. But yours, Linda the wife, the ice cream woman, oh, oh, which, yeah. by the way, I have to tell you, my mates are on me for this show in a minute. Um, <laughs> the teacher, oh, yeah. I smell shite. I know. Oh, the yeah. maw, he's got a stoner. Oh, yeah, <laughs> which, was... But I, I, and the, old, <laughs> the old woman, and I thought your take with Tom Urey, Yes, that's me. I'm rhyming off seven or eight. Well, it's just memorable. Ah, uh, well, well, thanks. And. It... I don't know, you, as you said, and I'll certainly not take away from any of the kind of talent or the skills that me and Ford and Greg had, and the writers in that, and Paul and Mark as well, and everybody that made it, and the comedy unit, everybody backstage, so everybody gets the box ticked for yeah. that. I'm not taking away from that. But there's something about it's the right time, the right place, the right mindset of the country that it just it draps it. You can maybe, I don't know if you did it 10 years before it or 10 years after it, if it would have had the same effect, maybe it would have yeah. been better, I don't know, but it just hit. So there's, there is an amount of luck for myself, there's an amount of luck in it. It's really me walking in and seeing Vance, do you know, who yeah. I hadn't seen for ages, uh, who had been with his pal, he was not at the auditions, he was there with his pal, yeah. and he was going to get a train. So it's those little moments that take you down a road and change your life. Um, so let me talk about some of the characters. Aye. Uh, how the hell do you sit down? How does the ice cream? I mean, oh. of, of all of all the, I mean, all my mates. You know, it's like I mean, aye, aye. football guys are like, I've got Cam Dar and Barkman on the lot, and they're all texting me the best sketch, and I'm like, you don't need to tell me. I aye. know, shut it. Oh. Right? How did that come about? Wow. And it wouldn't get past the censors now, would it? <laughs> Certainly wouldn't. <laughs> but it will not get censored out. Um, that's, I'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> so, how does it come about? Well, I never wrote it. Right. So it, was the, um, it was the boys that wrote it. It was Ford and Greg that wrote it. Uh, I do you know I'm saying that? And I don't know if that's I, I, if they actually did write it. But yeah. I'll just say that they didn't. If they didn't, whoever it wrote it, <coughs> need to get in touch with me and give me a doing. <laughs> um... So, but I did remember, so we did a read through, which I was reading through all the scripts and we're sitting in the office and I remember it says, do you know, external show, ice cream van comes in the corner, ice cream vendor, Cam, uh, is handing the cones to the wee boys and say, which are wee pal want? And, he's, and whispers, he's wanting a swatch your fanny. And then it's, and it says, 
<laughs> and do you know what's funny? It's, it's meant to be Swatch. And any time, if you watch it again, you'll see the, the wee boy says, Squatch. So sometimes people say to me, Squatch, and I'm like, ah, it's Swatch. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, and then it says, the ice cream vendor lifts Scott up, and I was like, ah, what is this? What are you doing here? What am I doing? And we're like, don't worry, we'll shout, cut. It's just put your horns on the skirt. And if you see it, that's what happens. Yeah. The skirt. And I'm like, ah, right, all right. But pff, where's the beans? And I don't know, we'll shout, cut, and everything. <laughs> well, there was a line in it, and they were like, the, 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 so the sensors allowed us to put it through, but they were like, you need to take that last line out. And the last line in it was, she pulls back down her skirt, and Lean Zorn says to me, boys, do you want a flake in that? <laughs> <laughs> but that's just not getting in. Uh, it's just not happening. Uh, it's it not was happening. such a good line. I mean, by the way, just out of curiosity, how did you get the two boys? How did you get away with the boy saying, God, he's a swatch of your fanny? I mean, that's just outrageous. What, there's is other, he nine? There's other stuff. Uh, I think it's for the Camden Marshall that there's one. I mean... <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's, and you see, they're trying to do the same thing again because of the success of the ice cream van sketch. So it's uh, an old woman uh, with her grandson and he's saying, what's in that big box, Granny? And I'm like, oh, that's something that your grandpa brought back for the wards. And it opened the box and a huge pole comes out and there's a lassie <laughs> pole dancing. And I'm sto- I'm like, ah, curried with the wee boy watching. He's like, ah. Ah, watching it, you know, I'm like, ah, ah, he loved it. He was awfully fond of that box of grandpa and his glasses writhing and everything. There's no way he would, do, would be able to do that. Uh, was there a character <laughs> Was there a character that you actually enjoyed? You know, sometimes in life, you know, you get, a, you do a job and you think, God, I'm getting paid to enjoy myself here. Right. What, what was, was there one that stood out for you? Uh, there's loads of them, but the, I think... The one I feel most connection with is the teacher. Aye. Because of a few reasons. A, that was my impersonation of my biology teacher. That was based on a real person. So that was my old biology teacher was called Mrs. Monroe. That was her. And I've been doing impersonations there out the back, <laughs> woman a fag, at the age of 12, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, I was in the day and she was like, oh, right, Karen, you. So I'm doing that in my school pals and when we were, uh, you know, doing the uh, series of Tune of Fantasies, have you got any characters? I says, I had an old teacher and I told him, and see that, the reproduction sketch? Yeah. That's, apart from the purple crayon at the end, <laughs> that is exactly what happened. Yeah. Was we went in and she was sweating bullets, man. She was just all over the place and, you know, it was like, that. Miss, what is that? You know, it was a diagram of Willie. What is that, Miss Schlatt? <laughs> well, Karin Dunbar. <laughs> I am I not surprised that you're asking that when there's when you don't even know who your father is? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm reliving most of them, and they're all, I mean, they're absolutely brilliant. The women that get plundered in the war. Um, plundered, what well, a word as well. It's just a great word, isn't plunge it? Plunge <laughs> up the coast for a plunge. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you sense at that point though <clears throat> was it season one season two and you thought hey we are on something here ah uh, man I was so delusional because I had uh, so there I built up my own business for bonkers there I'm out five nights a week running my own business for seven years yeah I was making money hand over fist hand over fist like that boof 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 <laughs> pockets and things like that um, I goes and does tune the fat. And this is, this, it's not about moaning or anything like that. It's just giving you the proper, the, it's not money. Money was shite. No, I mean, it? <laughs> but it's one of the ones, you know, that changed with the series two and things like that. So it's, um, there's no poor little rich girl going yeah. on or that. Anyway, um, but, and so I gave up all my work. I gave up all my work in the pubs and clubs. Once you hit season two? No, no, season one. Before we were filming that. But I don't, I was but so But you wouldn't have been making any money, surely? No. Not only was I not making any money, but we filmed for six weeks, which, by the way, was this week that we finished filming 25 years ago. Wow. The first series. 30th October was when we finished. So that was just this in this week, because I'm dead aware of that. Um, so I... Uh, Did you I, feel a risk? Did you think, no? no? 27, green as the grass. Plus, it's going to remember, Peter, I, I'm not saying then I'd turn my, put my hand to turn to gold, but things had worked out really, really well for me. Absolutely. And actually, and they did, it was just sometimes the time frame. I don't know. I just thought because I'd made a TV show that I was no <laughs> celebrity or something. <laughs> and that I finished filming. I had no work. And I was, 
just flat out with my phone. Phone. I don't even know who I thought was phoning me, but <laughs> just people in, in Scottish entertainment that knew I'd made a TV show. And that wasn't happening. Just I had any work. I ended up going back to the pubs. Well, I was going to say, you, you, you've done six weeks of a show. You've <laughs> given up all your work. Uh, and there's, there's only another 46 weeks to go in the year. What the hell are you doing? I, I had nothing. Uh, it was, and I, I went back to, worked in Bennett's and I worked in CC Blooms. I went back to in Bennett's and I was like, to Bobby who ran it, total cap in hand. Uh, towards Christmas, I had nothing. I spent all that, I didn't lose too much money. Were you I living in a flat? It. I was living in my, with my, I was living with my ex. <laughs> living with my ex as well, which was all right. We got own all right, but you know, it was, it was her flat and everything. Um, and uh, so I went back to Bobby Gibson, great man who ran Bennett's, and yep. says, "Bobby, I've got nothing." And he went, "Can I fill all your nights?" He says, "There was a, they'd opened another nightclub up the stair, a weird one." He says, "I can give you a Friday night up the stair." I went, "I'll take it." Wow. I'll take it. I went back to Cece's, Diane, my boss there, who was magic. Um, I went, Diane, is there any way I can match? She went, yes! I've sacked everybody. <laughs> so, like, I had the Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And Cece, she went, absolutely, you come back. Well, so she gave me the Saturday and the Sunday back. So I went, doing DJing the Saturday and the Sunday karaoke. So you're DJing while this is on and you're gaining notoriety? Aye. And, see, for the second series, I did not give my work up. So I was DJing, I was DJing at three in the morning and I was getting up sometimes, not every morning, but sometimes at six to go and film. Short of having a, like, nervous breakdown. Right, give me this then. Uh, do you get an agent then who negotiates for you? My agent was the comedy unit. Right. So that, and that worked out really well for me. Um, April, who was... Uh, Did they treat it like a family? Protect everybody? I felt that, I really, really felt that for them. Right. I felt that the majority of the time, and I don't want to sound duplicitous or anything, but in my best interest at hearts, whether I could see that or no was another question. But eventually I went on and got a, a, an agent down in London. Right. A London agent. Belinda. She's <laughs> magic. She's magic. And it was April that, that put me on to Belinda. Right. Um, of the scenes you, you're in, we've talked about them, they're absolutely brilliant. Were there scenes with the guys that you looked upon that they did that you thought, oh, God, I love that, that's great? Well, funny, the first one that comes to mind is the opposite of that. I remember us sitting down the read through and it says, the sketch, the boys are reading it and it says, uh, exterior shot, lighthouse, 1826 or something, blah, blah, blah. And then interior shot, like, first lighthouse keeper is reading a book. Gets to the end of the book and the last page is missing. Turns to the second lighthouse keeper who's eaten the last page of the book and says, go on and do that. <laughs> Second light housekeeper says, how? First light housekeeper says, just go on and know. And they read that, and I was like, oh, that's pish. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> and they were like, I oh, know, well, no, it'll be all right. We'll, we'll get dressed up. And I was like, good luck with that. I mean, it was the biggest catchphrase out of it all. Absolutely. So there's what they know, but there's loads of the bands with yeah. the, the guy. I mean, I can't even hit those. Do you know I saw one on TikTok the other night, and this is out of nothing, but I was ending myself. It's Ford walking along the street, just normal, but he's got a big shield, right? And I think it's uh, Paul and Mark, who are like two Neds in it, and they're like, ha, look at you, man, with that big shield. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, you shut your face and I'll put a shield in Kuala and kick your ass. Well, that one then, Ford puts the shield in, and the second he puts the shield in, three arrows go, <laughs> right into him, he's like, <laughs> got in myself with that, so no. that's out of nothing. I know, I know. I mean, I don't even get me the start out in the characters that they did. But Strangely enough. The banter boys. Yeah. Do you love it, or do you love it? <laughs> them, I love them. Anyway, there's loads. Well, we were working, obviously, because we work in football, the one that we related to was, big, and we still relate to it now, is when the two of them are at the track side Aye. and he's shouting the instructions Aye. and the assistants going Ford the exact that. same. I mean, it's absolutely priceless because there are guys like that. That was real life for us. But did you think it was never going to end? Aye. Yeah. And that is, uh, so, I mean, and it's, so that's, I'm 27. I've walked into, in a, I'm 26, I've walked into an audition. They've got me, they've phoned me the next day and got me in and put me on the radio. Yeah. Uh, then while we were on the radio, we got commissioned for the telly, we're doing a TV show, and then the next year, the next year, the next year, and then I get my end show. So we yeah. did four series of Chewing the Fat, we did four series of the Candon Bar show. Then I did a pilot, which died in its arse, I mean, yeah. I'm just honest, uh, that, and then nothing. And that was really, that was really, really hard. Yeah, because everybody thinks, you know, if you're in a particular game and you're doing well and you've, you, you reach a certain level, mm -hmm. they think, you know, 
there's no there's no pitfalls, there's no downsides. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk to you about something that I did watch that I found not disturbing, but quite enlightening of you as a person, and that was basically your TED Talk. Oh, aye. Oh, God, aye. I, I watched your TED Talk and I thought to myself, there's absolutely no bloody laughs in that whatsoever because it's quite, you know, it grabs you because you're being honest to people about situations. At what point in seasons chewing the fat or Karen Dunbar did you become a complete prick? Well, I mean, I don't know if this is, gives me any saving grace, but I was a prick long before <laughs> 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 that was when I was working in the pubs. Is that right? Aye. Um, my, my prickness had, I was shifting before I was then. So I'm dead lucky. I was just, I don't know, there was something about, and I, I, you'll know yourself, yeah. you, you know. It's easy for me because I've got a huge family, so there's no getting above your station. Right. So I was wondering about it from your point of view because well, I've looked back at your life growing up and right. I'm thinking, where is the safety valve? Is, is it, mm. is it a, a, a Vance that you're talking about? Is it a pal that you went to school no. with that I saw you interviewed? Is it somebody aye, saying, aye. hey, Karen, any chance? Aye. Like, who's like that? Screw the nut hen. Yeah. You're being an asshole. Um, uh, there, are, there, there was and is still a couple of people. People, the only problem was I couldn't hear them then. Right. So when I was working in the pub, the mayor, and I had, so I had five nights a week, I was out, big, big nights, I was, the, my nights were heaving, do you know, I had, I remember like doing the night in Bennett, so it was a Thursday night, and I says to Bobby, let me take the Thursday night, because um, it was dying, it was a, it was like kind of hardcore rave man yeah. at the time, and there was like <laughs> 20 people on a Thursday night rattling about, yeah. and I, so I started doing the karaoke on the Thursday in his pub, and then it was like a big party, and then everybody went to Bennett's, right. everybody went to the nightclub. And what were you playing? Uh, utter shite. <laughs> That's what it was called. It was called shite music night. In fact, I remember the first night being in, um, and one of the guys that had been at the hardcore rave was no happy what I was playing, and I, I, I actually put on. No, you kidding me? When will I see you again? Right, it was that level. Right, it was novelty that, but it's not as if I was playing all that all the time. No, he pulled a pint out of the decks. What? Oh, he pulled a pint out of the decks. He chuckled it. Anyway, so. I'd built up, so that night ended up with 400, 500 folk, as we were, it was well beyond health and safety. Yeah. This was crammed. So it's hard not to get a massive ego, as well when people are telling you, you're brilliant all the time, and I think I can do no wrong. Yeah. And then I start to talk to people, but then I also start to get paranoid. It's like anything else, like you build it up, and then the more you've got, the more they can take away from you. I, I'm very young as well and green, and loads of you want to go and talk it fucking. And I'm swearing now. Uh, but, you, know, you might go into like trauma and stuff like that, talking about younger years, all that stuff, which doesn't make me special. Most days I've got that. Yeah. But it's just that's my my version of that. Um, and not really knowing myself and and being feeling kind of out of control and no no being able to rein it back in. Yeah. Any way to do that, and so. Um, and I, I, you'll have seen it in the TED talk. Somebody wrote me. So I was just being in. I was as much as it was funny. Yeah. It was also horrible when I was r tearing strips off folk. Did people help you with the Karen Dunbar show? Because if you're a part of a collective and chewing the fat, where there's the sum of all parts makes a, su a success, were you worried that as an individual driving that show that maybe you weren't strong enough, or did you feel you were at the top of your game? I can just do these mm. sketches now without them. I think you need to be. I'm not. I'm not trying to avoid the question. So, what is the question? Well, Who's the, the them? <coughs> the, the question is, you, 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 you leave like no, that? no, you leave the chew and the fat, and as an artist, oh, with the, the you're, boys. you're now Karen Dunbar. It's the Karen Dunbar show, so aye, you've got aye. to try and make a success of it. Um, That's I'm, a different pressure. I'll be honest, and I'm being honest. With you, I was, ne I'm no, I was not aware of that pressure. Like thinking, no? oh, this will not work without the boys or All I was thinking about was, I, I can't really <laughs> like it was too much work. Right. The actual workload. I do remember walking out with the scripts and b with the boys. I'm only in a third of the stuff. If I am in that, you yeah. know, uh, and well, that's a right measure. No, whereas with the Candle Bar show, I'm in 99%. Of it. There was other wee sketches that I was in, but 99%. And I do remember thinking it's too much. I'll not be able to do it. Yeah. And then another bit of me was like, ah, we don't need to do that. You only do that. Like you need to just do it a day at a time. Yeah. So you do the, that day's sketches. Um, so that's where I felt that the pressure was not on whether or not it would succeed because it was just me. I was detached for that. That's not about, that's not about ego. That wasn't about like, I'll date with them. 
Aye. I'll tell you the truth. It just evolved. Aye. <clears throat> right. Yeah, I was more stressed about whether I was doing it good enough and whether I was able to uh, take on the workload. Right. And was there anyone in that show that pleased you particularly? In you, my show? Yeah. Oh, God. I mean, there was... Do you, you remember, you would see Leah, by the way, uh, Leah McRae, who's fantastic yeah. and who's in River City and she'll have done so much more than that. But Leah was just at a drama school and it was she was one of the people that we knew as soon as we saw her. She is going to be brilliant. Yeah. She was only 21. I mean, she's in sketches playing old women. She's a star. And as much, see, when you think about it, see when I was playing Betty, I was yeah. 27. <laughs> My favourite bit of that See, is when, 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 when Betty is eventually finding <laughs> her partner that she thinks is just as lonely as her, and she's getting China. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, why do you edit that? Because that's the ring, Betty. You're thinking the lonely shopkeeper. I am. I bet he was the old slapper. I'll bet he the old I, slapper, right, okay. So I bet. See the bloody what? problem with that many blinking I characters. Mean, I love that one of the lonely shopkeeper. Oh, it's it's, that's Julie and that's Greg's wife. Oh, is that right? Is that right? And, uh, and then she dies. Yes. And then the lonely shopkeeper puts on the freezer and she's got her <laughs> end it. She'll always be my pal. Yeah. Aye. Aye. So I, I think, so just to finish that off when you talk about the TED talk there, I'm, I'm lucky that I came here kind of ground zero yeah. before the TV show started. And let me I had, had to go and have a right good look at myself. I could. Through that letter that somebody had sent to me in the pub. And I was mortified. Yeah, because I, I, I looked at the TED Talk thing and I thought, well, <coughs> that is a different side to you that, that I hadn't seen. And it gives people a, a real insight into you. Um, you know, and the pitfalls that can, that, that can come along the way. Let me, uh, I've got a few things to go before we finish. Um, let me ask you then, what takes you down a road of, now I want to be a serious actress? Aye, that's interesting and all, because I don't know. And when I look at it now, I'm like, what was all that? <laughs> what was all that about? I think part of it, excuse me, <coughs> I think part of it again, <clears throat> it was people encouraging me. Yeah. I mean, as much as I might look like a sort of strong, independent woman, and of course I am, another bit is I'm led by the nose anywhere, folk like that. I think you would be good to know as a I don't even know what fit positions are. Yeah. Centre forward for Airdrie. Is that a thing? Yeah. Right. I'm like, ah, really? I'm keen that I go. I mean, there is a bit. What was it? Oh, I was watching. There's a new film out called Na uh, Nyad. Right. So it's the story of Diane Nyad. Right. If you're, you're probably caught that. But I'm just telling you, anyway, if you're into TED Talks, her TED Talk's brilliant, right? right I'm going to watch it. Diane Nyad. Yeah. What she did was she swam for Cuba, uh, Florida. Yeah. Right. And she tried to do it when she was 28. And she failed. And then she turned 60, she's like, I'm going to do it again. Oh, fuck. She had to take five attempts, right? <laughs> and you might see her coming out. She does the swim. It's a hundred hours. She does the swim. Yeah. She's 62 by the time she does it, right? Anyway, the film's actually shite. Yep. It's really <laughs> disappointing. Her own story's much better than the film. Jodie Foster, I'm like, what are you doing, Jodie? Every scene Jodie Foster, like, my wages in. My wages in. <laughs> I was just to turn up and see if my wages are in. Anyway, she speaks very highly of me, Jodie. But the point of that is... I don't know if, I can, if I'm going to remember what the point is. The point of that... Serious acting. Aye. Um, oh, but what was I telling you about that for? Aye, watching that... I fucking forgot. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this then. Led to the nose. I, and that's it. Aye, I'm watching that, right? <laughs> I'm watching her swimming for Florida. Uh, for Cuba to Florida and like that. I'd give that a shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was what I was going to say, because I was reading up on all these things that you had that you've done that maybe people don't know, and I'm thinking, the Tempest, give a break. Aye, well. uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, Meryl Streep's there. I know, aye. You must have just, aye. you shite yourself. <laughs> no. No? <laughs> right. I, because, and I'm no, I'm no saying no because I felt dead confident. Nerves, you'll, gain, you'll know this, nerves are a really weird thing. There are times where I'm um, going on to, I don't know, speak to 20 folk, and I'm like, what is the matter with me? See that TED talk? I've never been as nervous in my life. Yeah. Never. Uh, and there are other times, since doing the Commonwealth Games, there's 40,000 folk. Yeah, 1.5 billion of an audience. I know. And I knew that. Yeah. And I knew that that camera was going to come to me and go boff like that, and I would be doing the lens to that. No nerves. No. I think it was too much. I think I was in shock. And what about them, those three? Because I think, was it Jake Gyllenhaal, Meryl Streep? There was somebody else. Oh, there was loads in. That's... I mean, all the time. Glenn Close. Uh, Glenn Close there was, yeah. um, and there was other people. It was like, like, I was dead impressed with Kathleen Turner. 
Yeah. Come in, just like, oh, girls, come here. <laughs> Yo, wow. Oh. Uh, do you know Emma Toms? Because we did it in London as well, so Emma Toms when we was in, and um, there's just like, yeah. I can't even remember. Like, did you meet Emma Thompson? I did, I, I really she, liked I, her. I, she was good. She was, and, well, I say she was great, that sounds a bit, but she was dead nice. Yeah. Um, who was a wee bit off? Stockard Channing? Was no, like, oh, Rizzo. Stockard, because yeah. she was Rizzo in Greece. She just didn't come and talk to us. She talked to the, because they came backstage to see us. Standoffish. Aye, and she did a lot of work done as well. So yeah, I was like, absolutely. See so her clapping her ear and it was her mouth. <laughs> So I, was like, oh. I liked her as well. I, went, I, went, I was really excited that she was in. So yeah. no, it's funny, I didn't feel nervous, but I was, because they were in, um, there's times the nerves will come and go and they just don't make any sense why they're there. Right, here's a, here's a thing then. If you're, if you're, uh, you've got rid of that point, um, you're on TV, all of these things. What about your personal life? Um, was there ever a need, or did anybody turn around and say to you, listen, Karen, don't let everybody know you're gay. Oh, right. Oh, fuck. I wasn't expecting that at all. Yeah. No. No. And that's why, you know, it was no. Now, don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that I've no been, I'm just going to say stitched up there, but I've not been, let's say, disappointed in the press. Yeah. With the angle that they've took on some things. I mean, I did a big interview before, um, and that was just coming up to Christmas, to, Christmas 99, going into 2000. Um, I did a big interview about being in Chew and the Fat and everything. I know the interview was about was that I'd been like married before to a woman. Like right. I'd had a, a ceremony that was illegal and a double page spread about that. It was horrible. Yeah. That that was what the emphasis was on. Uh, and a few times I remember getting interviewed about a radio play I was doing. And doing it, and there was some comment that the, I mean, I've learned a lot about journalists, some comment that the journalist had made about somebody else being gay, and I says, and, and them no coming out, and I'd says, well, I says, everybody's got to do what they've got to do. I says, yeah. fortunately, I was already out. I says, and, um, people have been really, like, supportive of me being gay. Yeah. I was the, I'm going to swear again. That's where the fucking headline was. Uh, uh, people have been supportive <laughs> of me being gay, and I'm like, uh, well, the Why reason are you talking about a radio show that I'm doing? What is the point? What is that? There's got to be an angle on it. The reason I ask you is because of the upbringing that you and I had in that industry. I had millions of gay pals, Aye. and and it never bothered us. Mm. Never, we didn't we didn't look at anybody. You know, somebody say you're gay, and you look at them and go, well, who gives a fuck? Mm. You know, you look at the person, you look at the individual. Mm. They're your friend. Oh, yeah. you, you know what I mean? And then, but because of the world that you eventually move into, I mean, it's like George Michael, don't tell anybody you're gay. You're selling fucking millions of records. Aye. You know, so there's that um, image thing. So not well, I never had that. I mean, as well. <laughs> It would have been awfully, awfully hard coming for the fact that I've just been working <laughs> seven years, <laughs> five blends. nights a week. Yeah. Wait, and Does it hamper your relationship when you're trying to find the one? What, being gay? No, when you, no, not being gay, when you're climbing the ladder of success. I'm not avoiding the question. Right, make that question clearer. What is the one? What is, would you well, mean? Well, as oh, you... Oh, do you mean like trying to go with somebody? Trying to go oh, with somebody. Oh, fuck, it's murder. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, I've been single for about five years. Right. And I'm... Desperate. <laughs> You're gagging on it. Lassies, I'm, de I'm desperate. Uh, I say de it's no that like there's no that level of desperation. But what it is is, I don't. Where am I going? What am I doing? Because right, I've n I've never been on the apps. And one of my pals says, "Go on the apps." I went, "Oh come on, what am yeah. I doing? Putting a photo of myself on it." And when it says occupation, I'm like, "Well, you might know me." Yeah. Because no, everybody does, obviously. <laughs> you might. I says, and then what if, like, two wee boys are on the apps faffing about and they're like that? Yeah. Oh, my God, there's that old woman that my dad likes. <laughs> One wheel kid on with a lazy. Yeah. And, make her, and I'm sitting in Sanino's, do yeah. you know what I mean? Eating breadsticks, waiting for Denise to turn up at eight o'clock that's half past nine. There's two wee boys looking in the corner. No. Uh -huh. So I'm known. So I've need the apps. Um, Got asked to it a couple of times, but it just didn't not, connect. Not right. yeah. um, and I'm no out. Don't I don't really go on the set. I, I went I went and DJed because I've been DJing. I went and DJed a night in the polo lounge, which was brilliant. It was great, and folk were loving it. And there was quite a bit of attention from children. Yes, in their twenties. Too young. <laughs> okay. And, I mean, there are no children. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. I'm like twenty. Oh, wait a minute. It, nah, it, nah, it doesn't nah. it doesn't hamper Warren Beatty or some of the others. I'm no Warren Beatty. Okay, right. Nah. I mean that's just no 
laughing. <clears throat> I'm not, I'd, I'd like a, an intellectual equal, which will be hard. Right. <laughs> okay, we're going to put the call out. Right, before we finish, I've got a, a few things that I want to quickly um, get uh, uh, from you um, as far as who do you like now? Who, who inspires you as a comedian now? Or an actress or a writer? Uh, I mean, as I, I don't know about inspires as a comedian, but the first comedian that comes out of my head, I know actually who I love is still Harry Hill, which yeah. is a strange one. Do you no, know, I think magic. people expect me to be more like for stand up oriented. I might see Harry Hill at the Kings and I actually had to get my purple inhaler out. <laughs> I was laughing that much. That's how I was like, I'm laughing and I'm raking in my bag because I'm like, <gasps> um, there's a couple of actors, I mean, Jesse Butley, uh, you know, her fate, um, Jesse Butley. I can't even remember what she's been in now, but uh, she's phenomenal. Oh, Wild Rose. And she plays a Glaswegian in it. Right. And she's no for Glasgow. So yeah. See if you're doing a Glaswegian accent. I've seen that movie. That's a great movie. Right, well, that's her. Right. Jesse Butley. I went doing my pal. There's, a, there's, my, there's my celebrity just now. <laughs> uh, my pal, AJ. Her name's Anna Jane Casey. So she's like kind of West End royalty, Anna Jane. And she's in all the big shows. Uh, so she was in Cabaret. So right. I went down to see it was Jesse Butley and Eddie Redmayne. Oh, wow. Was in it. I mean, you're just like... And my pal was brilliant as well. But you're just like, this is so, it's like watching excellence. That yeah. sounds a wee bit, Ooh, but it is. No, you know your levels. That's something, yeah. something else. So to be able to, walk, you know, to be able to see people doing that, Meryl Streep, by God, still, I mean, I watched her in uh, Don't Look Up, which yeah. is magic in it. How she never won the Oscar for The Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which is like just a, it's not, obviously it's no a wee role, but it's no, it's no Sophie's choice or anything like that. But she, the things she does, with it. so anyway, that would still be in there. But I'm not looking to. Do, I don't want to do any more things. <laughs> 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 I don't feel I've got any huge burning ambition. I've done, I've done a lot. You can't even rest in your laurels. You've got so much more talent. There's so many more things to achieve. Surely. Well. I mean, this is not a plug for it because I'm full on with it, so I don't need any more work. But I, start, I started a social enterprise up by accident during the lockdown. Right. I, all the live work that I had had stopped, and I'll just tell you this in bullet points for the time and we've got, all the live work had stopped and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And after like a few months of cleaning cupboards and sort of like lying scrolling and no know what to do, and, um, I got in touch with somebody and I says, I'm going to do a music workshop, I don't, but I don't know what. And she says, well, try it out with my, uh, my pal works with refugees. Right. Group of female refugees in Glasgow, all, for all different parts of the world. We were on Zoom, we ended up making a rap. And while I was doing that, and we did it hour, we did four sessions hour a month, two hours. And I started making the music for it. I don't know, I don't play any instruments or that. I, I learned how to make music on Garage Band, and, and then I had to go into, uh, I can't remember it, Logic Pro. I had to go into Logic Pro because I kind of outgrew Garage Band, so I was watching YouTube videos. It gave me a reason to get up in the morning. Wow. And then somebody else says, will you come and date with us? And I went, on Zoom, aye. And the next thing I had four groups, four different groups, making four different notes. And then, so when that finished, when, the, when that finished, when the lockdown finished, um, the, they were all asking me to come back. So I started a new one yesterday. I've just finished a play on Saturday and I started a new rap workshop yesterday with a group of 14-year-old lasses. I've been in prisons. Uh, I've went and uh, worked at men's homeless shelters. Yeah. Um, it's a, like, loads of, there's a... So you're, you're giving something back. It doesn't feel like that. And no. I'm not, that's, that sounds wanky. <laughs> just to say that. That's, it, it, Disney feel like I, I get so much <laughs> Disney I yeah. don't feel like I'm there I'm doing a job right. I feel like I'm in today a job and I get loads of it but it's a job will there be any more comedy from Carmen and Bar? aye yeah. aye I'm doing an audience I'm doing these audiences which are brilliant it's me sitting getting interviewed and I much prefer that I don't enjoy doing stand up right. it's too stressful for me but see getting interviewed I'll do that all day so I start that tour on Thursday Ah, I'm going to on Thursday. Right, now here's, uh, I'm going to do quick fire questions to oh. you to finish, but <clears throat> one other thing that uh, I think would be great for you to, to mention, you love the DJing. I do. You're doing a great night that I think would be absolutely fantastic. So that camera is your sales point. Oh. Tell everybody how they can come along and enjoy you being a DJ. I'm going to be a DJ 29th of December at Oran Moor. From 7 o'clock to 11 o'clock, and it's me playing 70s and 80s music. But it's mainly requests, so you can come and tell me what you want to hear. And unless it's pish, I will play it. Um, and I'll also 
shout abuse at you or the mic occasionally and you get a photo taken with me. Oh, it doesn't get um, any better than that. You get tickets online. So I do that every three months. So that's the Christmas one. Brilliant. Looking forward to it. Um, okay, top five comedians of all time. I did send you the text. You did. Billy Connolly, <laughs> Harry Hill. Billy Connolly, Harry Hill, Harry Hill. Right, okay. So there you have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, top favourite comedy movies. Comedy movies. Five uh, of them. Have you got five? Five. Uh, Bridesmaids. Right, brilliant. Uh, Stir Crazy. Yep. Uh, Anchorman. Love it. Um, Zoolander. Oh, do you like Zoolander? I do right. like Zoolander. I know. Uh, and I'll probably, I'll be missing one out. I can't think of the fourth one. And there'll be a 70s one or something that I'm embarrassingly missing. Right. And and this one's an easy one. Um, I've asked more than a few people from pop stars to... Um, Jaws. That's the last Jaws, one. Jaws, it's a right laugh. Um, so, <laughs> so, three people in a car, on a road trip, you're driving, living or dead, you can bring them back. Having, Who are you having in the car? And they can be from any walk of... <laughs> Entertainment <laughs> politics and all. I'm laughing at the answer that came out of my head. <laughs> Shirley Bassey and my ma. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because my mum was a massive Shirley Bassey fan. My mum's dead 30 odd years. Uh, and there's uh, so often I think, oh, mum, I wish you were here to ask you this. Yeah. Like, just to ask you what your opinion is and this and what it was like for you as a Wayne and I didn't know this and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And just Shirley Bass, because for the uh, sheer entered, sheer star. I've met, you know, the people that I wanted to meet was Meryl Streep, Billy Connolly, and Shirley Bassey. And so I've met Billy and Billy and Meryl. Right. And I, I doubt I'll get to meet Shirley now. Well, you never know. She's going to watch this and actually say it herself. Shirley is a, is a big jazz fan. She's. <laughs> <laughs> she is. She's, Come on, Rangers. she's part of the Wales Loyal. Um, I love the Jews. <laughs> can I <laughs> uh, can I ask you who's the fourth one then? I like the fact that you're more that tells you a wee bit of Aye. sentimentality in uh, there. Fourth one. Fourth one. I mean, by the way, can I just remind you that's three women in the car. I don't Aye. want any balance in that but... the fourth one is. Right. But I'm not elaborating on this, it's just one word. Linda. Linda. Okay. Right, okay, there's something, <laughs> there's definitely something in that. Um, listen, it's been a, it's been an absolute joy. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. You did say to me when we were out at that pop quiz, can I swear? Mm. And you've actually curtailed it. I think you've been absolutely brilliant at that. Um, the trip down memory lane with you, Carden and Bar, all I have to say is thanks for coming. Ah, you're welcome, I really enjoyed it. Cheers, Peter. Brilliant.